I've been drinking kombucha for years now, and before I was ever making it at home from scratch, I was buying a ton of it at the store, and it still blows my mind how expensive kombucha is and how much money I was spending on kombucha when it really just cost a few bucks to make like a dozen of them at home. So today, we're gonna head over, we're gonna cross the canal, head over to that store right there, which is a big ass Whole Foods in Brooklyn, buy a store-bought kombucha, and I'm gonna show you how to multiply it for just a few bucks. All right, so here we go. 385 for one kombucha. And my goal is to multiply this by maybe 10 or 12 for the same price of one. And just remember, if you are trying to multiply this at home, you need to get a kombucha that's organic, that's raw, that's not pasteurized. Because through the manufacturing process, some kombucha companies pasteurize their kombucha. They don't have the live cultures you need to grow a scoby from scratch. So just make sure it's organic, raw, and it's not pasteurized. So the first step is accomplished. We've got the proper store-bought kombucha. It's organic, it's raw. And step two is growing a scoby from scratch. And a scoby is that weird little slimy thing that grows on top of your kombucha. Sometimes you'll see them in the bottles, those little floaty things. Those are baby scobies. And you don't actually have to do this step to make more kombucha. If you pour this right into sweet tea, boom your tea is gonna ferment you're gonna have more kombucha but if you want to make really good kombucha at home it is good to grow a scoby from scratch first before you move forward because this is a fermentation process and fermentation is alive it's very environmental so you want to get your kombucha used to your environment you want to start it up before you really make your final batch so to grow a scoby from scratch it's actually pretty simple you're going to take two cups of water Bring that to a boil, and you're gonna steep two black tea bags in there. Just let those sit for around 15 minutes until they are properly brewed and extracted. Now take those tea bags out and add half a cup of sugar and make sure that is completely dissolved. By just stirring that around, there should be plenty of residual heat to dissolve the sugar. And then you wanna make sure that comes to below 90 degrees. So you can stick an ice cube in there if you wanna speed that up or just let that cool naturally. Because if it's too hot, you will actually kill the rawness of this kombucha and you won't be making any kombucha at home. And then once it's cooled down a bit, just pour in a full bottle of your organic raw kombucha. Now make sure you cover your brewing vessel, whatever that is, make sure it's covered tightly. I use a cloth so nothing can get in there, but air can still escape. Basically all that we've done is taken a kombucha that's ready to drink, that's fully fermented, and we're feeding it. We're feeding it with the sugar and the tea so it has food to reproduce to grow this scoby. So that's it, we're just gonna let that sit in a warm place. Kombucha likes a warm environment, ideally around 80 to 90 degrees, and let the yeast and bacteria perform their magic. So as you can see, I'm not in my apartment right now, I'm in my studio, but we do have a SCOBY. This has been hanging out for about 10 days. And the thing is, this SCOBY, you'll see, it's not pretty at all. And I'm actually happy it turned out, you know, in this form. It's all rickety and all messed up. Check this out. It really is not much. It's just like a few globs. And that's all right. I've made scobies in the past where they're perfectly round and beautiful. But sometimes when you're starting up and the scoby's getting used to the environment, maybe you're rattling this thing around a little bit, just like I was doing. I was transferring it to the studio. It disrupts the, the surface growth and it's not gonna be beautiful. But in the kombucha world, we tend to put a little too much emphasis on a beautiful scoby when the truth is it doesn't really matter that much. It's more about the liquid. If you have a thriving colony of yeast and bacteria in here, and it's a strong starter, that's what matters the most. And that's what we have here. It's a strong starter, it's very sour. So you can see the scoby right here. I mean, there's a few pieces, but it's really not much, but it doesn't matter. That's all we need. So I'm gonna take a clean cup 
and just sample some of this. Give it a smell, super strong, very strong smelling, which is a good sign. Mm. That's actually not bad. And we want it extra sour, not necessarily on the level of vinegar yet, but close to it, not kombucha that we wanna drink, which is the point. We want a strong starter liquid, so when we go to make this next batch, which we're gonna do right now, it brews us a really great batch. So what I'm gonna do is just pour off all of this, because we're pretty much starting over with this starter liquid and that SCOBY in there. And then we're gonna brew about, this thing holds just over a gallon of liquid. So we're gonna brew another batch, a full batch of kombucha right now. And then we're gonna add this starter liquid to the fresh sweet tea to ferment the kombucha. So to make the kombucha, all we have to do is make a fresh batch of sweetened tea. And I'm gonna use some black tea because that's the most common tea used for kombucha and it can handle a high temperature. So it's great for beginner's kombucha. I'm gonna use five tea bags for one gallon of kombucha here, and I'm just gonna tie those up so they stay secure together. So next we have to boil some water to steep our tea, and I'm using the concentrated tea method. So it doesn't matter exactly how much water you boil, we're actually gonna add more fresh water on top of that later on. Bring your water to a boil, and then just let that sit for 30 seconds, and then you can drop in your tea and let that steep for 15 minutes. Now in the meantime, we can clean off our jar just to give it a fresh start. Then we can add our sugar and it's one cup of sugar for one gallon of kombucha. Once your tea is done steeping, you can remove those tea bags and just let them drip for a few seconds and then pour your hot liquid over the sugar and let that dissolve. Give it a few stirs so it dissolves right into that hot liquid. So our tea is dissolved in here, and the reason I like teaching the concentrated tea method is because we don't have to wait around for this to cool. As long as your jar is marked off, the volume is marked off, now all we have to do is pour in our filtered water and get us right up to that gallon mark. And because you use the right amount of tea, you know you're good to go. So we're up at a gallon. I'm gonna let it cool down a little bit because this isn't that much liquid, so it's still a little hot. And the SCOBY is definitely in harm if it goes above 90, 95 degrees. So I would let this cool down to at least 85 degrees before you add in your SCOBY. All right, our tea has cooled off. And just take a look at the difference in color right here. That's pretty dramatic. You have this light brown fermented kombucha and then this black tea. Obviously this is super dark. And what's happening in the fermentation is the bacteria and yeast are feeding off the purines in the tea, which lightens it up. So that's a very good sign that you've properly fermented kombucha if you're using black tea and it turns to this shade of brown. So now it's time to add our starter. I'm just gonna add about a cup in there and make sure, there it goes. The SCOBY just popped right in. Give that a stir and then pop on a cover. Make sure you don't use cheesecloth. You want something that's gonna keep everything out except the oxygen. It needs some airflow because this is both an anaerobic and aerobic fermentation, a very unique fermentation. It needs oxygen getting in, but you definitely don't want fruit flies getting in there as well. So just a nice cotton cloth will work well. So this kombucha is ready to ferment. It's gonna take around seven to 10 days for the first batch. And kombucha is a tropical ferment, so it likes warm temperatures. So if it's room temperature in your house, find a place that's warmer or put it on a heat mat or better yet, a heat wrap would be great to get it around. 80 to even 90 degrees. That's when it's really gonna thrive and taste the best. And just take a look at this. This is my SCOBY hotel right here. So you can see these are some serious SCOBYs. They're nice and thick. They look pretty. Well, as pretty as a SCOBY can look. And we don't have that yet, and that's totally fine. But this kombucha is gonna work its way up. Every single time it's gonna to adapt to the environment, it's gonna get a little stronger and the SCOBY is gonna grow thicker. So we should get a nice layer of SCOBY in the next seven to 10 days. And I'm gonna check in on this every few days. So I'm at this campsite in Long Island and I've been on the lookout for some wild 
edible, some wild fruit for my kombucha. And I just found the mother load. These are all wild raspberries and blackberries. So I've been picking a bunch. This will be perfect for the booch. Save a little cash. Boom, it's been about eight days on our kombucha fermentation. You can see we've got a nice layer of scoby right here. The liquid has turned from that dark black tea color to a lightish brown color, which is a great sign that your fermentation is happening. And the scoby, you know, it's not like thick like these, but this is the first time we're brewing kombucha, so it's gonna take time to work its way up. But most importantly, when you taste this liquid, it's acidic with a little bit of sweetness left as well. And carbonation is the number one question that I get when it comes to kombucha. Everyone wants a perfectly carbonated kombucha, and it's difficult to tell when your kombucha is done fermenting, when it's ready to carbonate. There's no recipe that can tell you, there's no machine that can tell you. You have to know what to look for, what to uh, taste, what to smell, which is why I created an entire quick start guide to brewing perfect kombucha at home. You can click the link above, it's completely free, and I go into detail on that process, how to tell when you're ready for carbonation and how to properly carbonate your kombucha every single time at home. So click the link above or below to get that quick start guide, and we're gonna get to bottle carbonating. This is where our kombucha gets very exciting because not only do we get to add a fizziness to our beverage, but we get the addition of flavor at this point. And it's awesome when you do it at home because you can choose whatever flavor you want, flavors that you can't find in the store. And the way carbonation works, we're taking our fermented kombucha, which has some residual sugar left over, then we're adding more sugar with the addition of fruit we're trapping that in a bottle so the yeast continues to eat the sugars and the byproduct of that fermentation process is CO2. And we are trapping that CO2 in this bottle and creating carbonation. So what I do first is take out my SCOBY and save at least a cup of starter liquid for your next batch. Now you've got to add your flavoring to your bottles. I use these nice flip top bottles. They're perfect for carbonating because they release some gas pressure if it builds up. And I'm gonna start with that wild raspberry juice and I'm just gonna pour a bit into each of my bottles. And then I also have some ginger because ginger is super cheap and the spiciness really is a great addition to your kombucha. It cuts some of that sourness. And then another flavor I thought would be nice is some melon because I had a bunch of melon left over and I'm trying to get rid of it. So I sliced up some melon and then I sliced up some jalapeno because I had one lying around. I thought a spicy melon kombucha sounded really interesting. And once those bottles are filled up, then you're just gonna top it off with your fermented kombucha and pop those tops back on. As far as knowing how many bottles you're gonna fill up, I generally just wing it. You can of course break it down by ounces and do the calculations. I was off by just one kombucha right there. You can just drink that plain if you don't have the ingredients or the bottles or just fill up another bottle. So check this out, it's been about three days. I just left for the weekend. If I pop open this right here, oh, see all of that carbonation? It just kind of sprayed out. You can see the bubbles there. So these things are ready to go in the fridge and they'll cool down a little bit. When I say cool down, the carbonation will settle just a little bit. But this one right here, 
Ah, uh, that's not bad. It seems like there's a little less sugar in this wild raspberry one. So I'm just gonna let that go for another day and it should be perfect and I'll pop these in the fridge. All right, so I've waited one more day on the raspberry and ginger. Uh, oh yeah. Wow, okay. <laughs> Now this is ready to go. You can see that right there. So I'm just gonna pull these and I'll put them in the fridge, but I'll do the actual taste test right now. Okay, so we've got wild raspberry and ginger right here and we have cantaloupe and jalapeno. Very excited for both of these. I like serving my kombucha on the rocks just because I like drinks on the rocks. I like ice. So we will start, let's start with this one right here, the cantaloupe. We'll see how that, all right. Not too crazy on the carbonation. That's, you can see the carbonation has mellowed down a good bit on this one, which is nice, you know, it's still fizzy. The smell is insane. The jalapeno hits you right away. Right. Mm. Damn. You know, there's a tiny bit of spice there, but the jalapeno is more just a, an aroma, an essence throughout the drink, which I really like. This one tastes like you're drinking a cocktail. Like if you ordered some spicy margarita, it's the closest I've ever gotten a kombucha to taste like a cocktail without adding any alcohol. So that is a great cocktail replacer, these flavors. All right, moving on to, this one might be a little crazier on the carbonation, so I'm just gonna, yeah. It's always nice, just lean it, oh my God. See, I didn't put this in the fridge to let that carbonation settle. So you can see it's a little over carbonated, but not too bad, whoa. Look at that. <laughs> Very excited for this one right here. Wild raspberries. Never tried that in my kombucha. Mmm. I like that. It's not too sweet, which is nice. The raspberries were a little more tart, but it came out really nice, and it's incredible the difference between these two flavors. Same fermented tea, same kombucha, just flavored differently. And we have, look at the colors on those. It's what makes kombucha so fun. It turns it from just a fermented tea that's healthy for you to something really special. So I hope this video helped you out. It took you along on all of the steps. Yeah! Remember, if you want more details on carbonation and really getting your kombucha game to the next level, click the link above for my kombucha quick start guide. It goes super in depth on certain processes to get you in a great place in your kombucha brewing game. And remember to follow me at Life by Mike G because I'm posting all of my crazy fermentation and food experiments in this studio. So I'll see you next time. Stay cooking.